lived in an 18 inch box in our front room with Terry and June, the goodies and the six million dollar man. <laughs> she was a woman barely alive. Gentlemen, we couldn't rebuild her. We didn't have the technology. Nothing we could say or do could ever be as funky as that gibbon. She came out of her box occasionally to cook us our tea or to do the ironing, but you could tell she wasn't really there. Always that same twitching restlessness. She couldn't wait to get back, open up another can of laughter, speed her life up to Steve Austin's pace, overtaking in slow motion. We weren't to disturb her viewing. Afraid to move, to speak, to breathe, judge it wrong, and the jellyfish sting of her hand across my thigh left sudden scarlet marks across my heart. It's not that she never tried to wean herself off that teat. She was always on the lookout for novelties, anything that could break the tedium of being working class and female. When I was nine, she had a fad for baking bread. The table juddered as she thumped the dough, her angry fingers choking its gluey mass, murdering its grey amorphousness. She took a couple of courses at the Tech, so proud of her French and German GCSEs, the only certificate she had ever held, 14 when the Blitz blasted her out of school. But it never lasted, it never led to anything. She couldn't see how it could. The careers advice we got at school bemused her. Find a job you can be happy in, but you're not supposed to be happy at work. <laughs> if you were, they wouldn't have to pay you. <laughs> like everyone who's never had any, the only thing she understood was money. She didn't know what she wanted, but she told herself she was content with marriage to a meek and barely visible man who just kept very, very, very quiet, did what he was told, handed her his pay packet every Friday like a shy child giving a finger painting to mummy. At night, they hid together under a balding candlewick bedspread. The rest of the time, he cocooned himself in silence and she climbed back into her box. She wanted something better for us, but even her dreams were made for TV. Blurred cliches clipped from Crown Court, General Hospital to the Manor Born. A job that you could get just by passing exams where you wouldn't need connections, but which would transubstantiate us into the kind of people that she feared and despised but worshipped. The kind of people who cooked with garlic and <laughs> had dinner parties and drank wine and listened to classical music and went on holiday on planes. She'd never be able to talk to us again, I mean really talk to us. It would be like sending us on a one-way mission to Mars. But she was prepared to make that sacrifice. Because happiness could not be found anywhere on Earth, but surely happiness could be found in that strange, red, radioactive world the other side of the asteroids. Times changed. Sale of the century and celebrity squares gave way to strike it lucky. But she never did. That glamour, that excitement, that indefinable something she hoped would be transferred down the cathode ray tube never shone her way. I got out fed up of competing and coming second to cuckoos, shadow puppets, borrowers who abseiled their way down the aerial into my home and her heart like the fucking milk tray man. I wish I'd tried harder now. My mother now lives in a five-foot box. 
And I'll never get her out of that one. I came from a respectable working class family. If you don't know what that means, it's when you're working class, but you really wish you were middle class. <laughs> um, some of my family are, we ate our main meal at five o'clock in our front room, washed down by cups of tea, but we had the telly tuned to BBC Two while we were eating. Um, and my parents, they have very respectable working class values. They were very anti-drinking, they were very anti-sex, um, they were very anti the body, we never talked about the body, um, which made puberty very interesting. Um, <laughs> that's what this poem's about. <laughs> I have blood on my hands. I am ten years old and have just opened my door to a delivery nobody told me to expect. Whipped off the plain white lid to find a severed heart pulsing out blackberry clots through hewn-off arteries. I run screaming for my mother, but she tells me to keep my voice down, wrap it up in toilet paper, put it in a paper bag and bury it at the bottom of the bin. It's perfectly normal, she says, not meeting my eye, but never mention it to anyone ever again, especially not in front of your father. It happens again when I'm staying with an elderly aunt and I'm not prepared. I don't know what to do and I dare go to the toilet, hoping that if I don't look, it won't be happening. We're taught to turn the key tight on our chamber of horrors, tell no one where the bodies are, but murder will out. Eventually, I wet myself. The raspberry cordial snaking down my thighs, ruining my white knee socks. Today, I'm half in love with the iron-rich tang, the meaty smell. Call out a cheery greeting to the butcher who slaps a ruby red steak on my counter once every four weeks. Exchange banter with the heating engineer who bleeds my radiators once a month gently loosens a nut on my boiler. He's hinted lately. He's coming up for retirement soon. 